to talk about now is um, TAP and ADQL. Um, TAP is the table access protocol. We heard about that already um, today a few times, which is basically designed, um, well, to access table data, and um, especially for table data in astronomy. And how do you access it? Well, you use the astronomical data query language to access um, to access the tables or the catalog data that you have. Um, the talk will have three parts. First of all, why bother about this at all? The second will be a first query, and we'll continue then with an example of um, how ADQL is going to work. So we already heard about that, um, that with Gaia data and astronomy, we, we have a change in the paradigm, because now um, we, we are talking about big data and astronomy as well, and the tables will be bigger than we can actually process them. So though with the first Gaia data release, it's a few hundred gigabyte if you download it all. This is entirely possible to download in a few hours and you can put it on your, um, onto your um, hard disk and then work with that. But pr already processing that will, will be a challenge and exchanging data with colleagues, even um, via a, a very good um, connection of a one gigabit net, um, is getting, um, getting very slow. So. Um, we have a lot of um, the, the buzzwords around that, how do you solve that. One solution for that, or with the, um, one solution to cope with that is that you select things or the data that you want to access remotely um, prehand. So um, data intensive science is about, first of all, using many data collections, which is we have the Gaia data, but the Gaia data itself, um, well, it's great, but we want to cross match that with other, um, with other surveys like the SDSS, like TUMAS, or the ones to come, there will be foremost, there will be um, 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 low far, and so on. And we're talking about um, large data collections. We heard that um, um, the question already appeared, what is about with the next surveys? They won't be, uh, then we're not talking about terabytes, we might be talking about petabytes. How do we cope with that? How do we make cross matches and perform cross matches for that? And point one, the answer for um, using metadata collections, um, there is an answer for that, um, that's we have to define standard formats and standards how to access data. You don't want to learn how to access the SDSS and Gaia, and you don't want to learn how to access LOFA. You want to learn how to access data and then apply it to the different surveys. So in the virtual observatory, the answer for that is with, um, we are defining standards how you can do this. TAP and ADQL is one of these standards. And the second is that um, you only access the data that you're really interested in. Usually you're not interested in all the bunch of the Gaia data, you are interested just of a small subset, a very, very small subset actually of the one billion um, 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 sources that we have in the catalog right now. So it's actually very smart to try to make a, um, um, a selection of a subset at an, at an early stage and you download only um, the data that you're really interested in. So the virtual observatory in general is, a, is, an, uh, is an answer about solving the problem how to deal with many data collections and diverse data collections, and TAP and ADQL in particular are the answers about um, dealing with large data collections. So now what is TAP, the table access protocol? TAP services provide database interfaces. That's the first of all. So uh, there is a database running in the background. Um, we heard that at ESAC they are running Postgres. In Heidelberg we are running Postgres for our byte databases. We have good reasons for, for that. There might be different databases running. I think in Edinburgh they are running, um, um, they are running some Microsoft solution for that. And that's completely fine because um, which technolog um, technology is run in the background doesn't matter. A tab service is just a standard defined. This is how things shall, shall interact with each other. You can little think about that um, if you select a browser which you use to access a web page. It doesn't matter if you say take Safari or Firefox or whatever, you take uh, the browser of your choice to um, access the web page, and that's very similar here. Tab services understand ADQL. Well, that's what they are designed for. They accept upload tables from, for computing. We already heard the buzzwords code to and bring code to the data. So yes, you're allowed to take um, your data to and part of code to a tab service, and the tab service will compute that and will compare that. This is called tab upload so far, and it's um, not uh, really what uh, we will expect in or what we're we going to in the in the next um, decades but it is what we have for now that you can upload data and pre-process it on a remote machine 
I will talk about a lot of that in the Eddie Kuhl hands-on course, and I think the, um, the tutorials also um, are dealing with that. Um, and um, of course, the tap service is returning table data, tap services. And um, well, uh, here it comes to a little to the theory behind that. A table actually is a set of tuples of tuples. So a table row is a set of tuples, and lots of rows in a table are tuples as well. So a table is a tuple of tuples. So um, if we have a tuple of tuples that says us something, yes, we are back and in the first semesters. Um, then we can use algebra, a relational algebra, to work with that. And that is exactly what databases do. I will talk about that in a few slides. ADQL now is designed to fit the needs of astronomers. That's why it's the astronomical data query language. It was first recommended in ADQL standard 1.0 in 2005, based on SQL, or SQL. And um, there was a long discussion um, and before that, uh, be, one, one can see in the history, I wasn't part of the VO back then, but it's interesting to see how that developed from SQL into ADQL. And since 2008, we are at the current standard of ADQL 2.0. Um, and uh, right now, ADQL 2.1 is expected to be recommended in 2017 to be then the new standard. And you see there is, in defining standards and discussing standards in an open source and open access project, um, there is much time that you can, can invest and maybe uh, waste or on that. ADQL and TAP services are implemented on 104 services so far, amongst them Zimbat and the ESA archive. That's how we're going to access that. But also there is um, um, UKITS in, 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 um, in, there, in there. We have the Garvo archive in Heidelberg, and there is the AIP and the CDS, of course. So there is a lot, a lot of more. It's implemented on several clients. Most popular Topcat and um, Stilts, um, but also just recently developed in PyVO, so we can use Py, um, Python to, um, to, to, to make queries. This is also an answer to what do I do actually do if I have terabytes of data that I want to compare with terabytes of data? Well, I can cut my data into pieces and make lots of queries and um, use PyVO and AstroPy to do this. This is a course on itself, we will maybe see um, a little how we can deal with that in the courses. Why SQL? Um, SQL is a, is a database query language, which you use to manage databases. So you have, um, you have um, statements like, I insert or I create a database, I update databases, I want to delete parts of the database on, in, the, in the tables, and I can select um, parts of the um, database. This is how I actually query. Now, ADQL, um, is not about giving you the chance to um, insert or delete or um, update or change the database, of course. Um, the data that we have is curated and there is only the, database, um, the, the data center managers to do this. So we only needed the select statement. Um, and the select statement is ta was taken from SQL. Uh, and how you actually do these, um, these select statements, there is a lot of science behind that on there is, they're getting can be very complicated, but we will see that it's actually very easy to get behind it. Why was SQL chosen as um, the base for that? The first of all, there is a solid theory behind it in relational algebra. SQL is in use since the 70s, and um, it's not yet outdated, it's just a definition of how could, can we access database data. And um, since there is a lot of, um, it's, it's um, um, quite old or established, there are a lot of high quality engines available um, that understand SQL that you can use for that. So many databases you may have heard of uh, like, um, like Oracle or like MySQL or Postgres, um, they have a SQL interface that you can use for that. So there is a lot of, um, a lot of um, um, experience already, um, already in there. And SQL is not Turing complete. That is important because then you can have something of a reasoning about the program written in SQL, which is quite, um, quite feasible because maybe your query is, um, is a little messed up and you made a mistake in that. So if the database, before you um, 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 perform a single query and the database is messed up for the next days and it's just waiting for that, the database itself can make an estimation of how long will I need for this exact query and maybe I can change the query at a certain point to, to um, make the query go faster. We will see in the courses 
um, why numerically that doesn't make sense, where algebraically it doesn't make sense. But um, the Turing completeness um, wouldn't be a feature. If there is a question what Turing completeness in this case means, it simply means Turing complete is a language if you can, or is a language if you can compute everything that's computable. With SQL, you can't. So you're lacking, for instance, loops or if statements, which is so quite, um, that doesn't make, or that's the reason why SQL isn't a real programming language, but or only a database language. Now about the part about the relational algebra. Um, so um, we have to talk about this um, um, little, um, not, too, not too long. SQL comes with a um, unary select, which basically means you can choose um, um, a subset of a set of tuples um, matching conditions. So you can say, well, I'm only interested in a subset of these tuples and I can, um, um, that I want to access. Um, it comes with a unary project, which means from the subset of tuples, I can skip tuples in, that I don't need. I can reduce these subset of tuples, which basically means there might be columns in a table that I don't need, that I'm not interested in, and that I can, um, can, can leave out of my query so they don't mess up my line. Um, my, my bandwidth when I download the data. Don't underestimate this. If you're not interested in colors in a, in a catalog, then you're also not interested in the arrows of the colors, which reduces um, 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 many catalogs quite a bit if you just don't have these bytes um, included into your query. You have a unary rename. That's kind of a technical, technical thing that you can set aliases um, to which you can refer. Um, Important is there is a binary Cartesian product, so I can have um, ta two tables and I can make a Cartesian product from that. So I have two sets and make a Cartesian product. This comes very feasible for cross-matching. Of course, you don't want a Cartesian product of two tables in this case, but of, um, again, of a subset of these tables where certain conditions are met. So you can have a unary select combined with a binary, with a binary Cartesian product. It doesn't make a cross-match, actually. You have the binary union and the binary difference with, yeah, well, that's, um, that's also what you, what you do with sets. If you have sets that are very uh, comparable, then you can, co in, in the data structure, then you can compare them and say, well, I can union, make a union of these sets and I can make a difference of these. So um, that's what you actually need. The good news is you don't need any of that, note any of that if you actually write ADQL, but it's good to have it heard once because it may help you um, with your queries. Why don't we use just simple plain SQL? If SQL is so great and it comes with all that we had, why don't we use simple SQL? Why was there the need for ADQL? First of all, um, SQL lacks geometries and regions, something that um, astronomers very, very much like. I want to define a region on the sky. We heard the word cone search. And um, actually the cone search is um, in the data, well, the database knows columns, but we have, um, 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 when we have positions in a sphere, we have actually one information, the position on the sphere, that's spread amongst two columns. And I cannot change these columns and I cannot merge these columns. So the database kind of has a problem here. A SQL databases are not designed for exactly that. They were not designed for um, for spherical data and um, cross-matching even gets worse when you do use spherical positions and databases were not designed for that. And they were not designed to query on this. So there was quite a lack of geometries and regions that uh, were introduced in ADQL, some useful mathematics and functions as well, and um, um, that we, 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 we implemented into that. And of course, the, the cross-matching on spherical positions was in there. That was the reason why ADQL was invented. And of course, there were also the idea that um, in future, in future database um, development, um, spherical data, we heard of PG sphere as a buzzword here already, which is for Postgres, um, an extension of Postgres that will help us and will boost the performance of cross-matching on um, spheres a lot. Now, um, select for real. Well, what does an ADQL query look like? We saw briefly saw um, some already. Now, roughly, um, an ADQL query looks like that. You have a select statement. You, oops, you can say set a top limit. 
and you have a select list, so the top just means the limit I just want here, the first results returned. It might be, well, up to you what you want. You have a select list. You can select certain columns that you choose only to download to access. You have a from clause, which basically will refer to a table. It might also refer to a result of a, already, um, of a select statement, because the result of a select statement will be a table. That's always the case. So, um, and you have a where clause, where you can, um, which, which will cover conditions, so that you, um, well, that's what we had already, that was the unary select. I will only select those things that um, um, match a condition. I can group by columns and I can order by columns. Um, Grouping is the um, histogram-like function in, 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 in SQL already. We use it often in LDQL. The order is something that can mess up your query because um, order basically, um, you, you can, nothing, nothing is as, um, as slowing down a database or giving a database uh, much work as letting the database bring something into order. So with order by, just by saying, oh, I want it ordered, my data or the result, um, may slow down your query um, by, by, well, it's, it's unbelievable. Be, believe me, you, you, can, you can immediately boost all your queries if you leave the order by out, or if you apply it only when you really need it. Usually, that is not the case. Um, so, give you an example on one of these, what, what that looks like is um, the top part, and if you just see this query, well, that's a complete valid um, SQL query. Select the first five results from the Tega source catalog. And that's the first query I want to show. I hope I have it here. So I'm in, in the top cat tab window, and I selected here the Gaia service at, um, at, Isaac, um, at Isaac. And you see on the, um, on the bottom, you see um, um, the, the web address for this. And I can use the service, and um, here I have the TopCat window. And since I have time, I can maybe say a little about the TopCat window here because it's very feasible and it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. I have on the left part, I see the tables on the Gaia service here, and I see the number of tables, it's 42. On the right part, I see a metadata part window that, that I can use to browse the metadata on. Um, on, of, the, of, of the tables that, that um, I want to access. And below I have the, the window or the web part, the field of my query. Now that is very feasible because I can access um, the data, the metadata, and the query at the same time. I don't need to open a browser and read the documentation or a PDF viewer to read the documentation of the service. Um, I have the metadata handy and I can, can immediately see um, what's in there. And I can easily do this by just clicking on a, um, on a table and look into the metadata here. So I see that in Allwise Best Neighborhood, I see, which is, I think, um, a cross-match table, I see what's the Allwise um, object ID and the source ID and the Gaia data. And now if I go to the Allwise data, then I can see um, the data type in the columns. I see the column name here. I see the data type in the column. I do see the units that I, um, that I, um, that I um, um, of the data in there, which is, Quite important because if I, following the idea of I bring, um, I bring code to the data that I access, and I want to write algebraic expressions in my in my um, um, query, then um, seeing the units at, at this point is quite important because then I don't need to think a lot of that. I have all information that I have already at the at the at the, at the spot where I use it, where I need it, and where I apply it. And of course, if I browse to the right, I see more, um, I see more descriptions. I see the, a description, a human readable description, and I see UCDs, this, which is um, unique con unified content descriptors. Sorry, um, this is for machine readability here, so that uh, machines can can read um, and learn about that. So you see, for instance, um, POS ec um, RA, Well, that's that's the UCD for um, for a position. Um, in RA, in the position in DEC, and um, the statistical arrows, you see that um, we do have in all wise colors in here and statistical arrows. And um, that's quite interesting when you, um, when, you, when you use the whole thing in scripts. 
I talked about PyVO, for instance, or about AstroPy. Yes, you can write scripts and you can let them um, use Python just to query a lot of these, um, these services. And you don't look into, like, because you, you re expect a thousand um, records as a result, but maybe you expect more like hundreds of millions of results, then you can just let, the, let the, um, your scripts or your, your pipelines do the work. And if you take the units with you, thanks AstroPy and NumPy, this is already fast. If you just take the metadata with you from the early step to the last step, then you don't even in a, in a perfect world, you could, um, you could simply publish your software and your ADQL st statements and say, this is the data that I used. And this would be uh, maybe already your paper or your publication. Of course, you can, will write a paper for that. But this is then actually what you can publish um, to people. And, um, and say, instead of, well, here, look, at, this is my petabyte of data, you simply say, well, this is the query that I used for that, and this is um, a several megabyte. Now, um, do it yourself, and people can follow that, or um, extend your code and use it later. And you don't have to think about these things if you have, um, if you have um, good, good metadata. So, thanks to Mark, this um, metadata browser is, is, um, is here in Dropcat. And, well, below we see the query that I had, that I, that I um, showed in the um, presentation. And here we will perform that in TopCat and run the query. And the result now is in the TopCat window here. Oh, maybe I should just move it to the, yep, to the other window. So, and if I look into this, then, well, that's not much of data, but it's exactly what I expected. I took just the first five results from the Tegas catalog. Um, I could have taken the first um, two million results, then we would have waited a minute, um, of course. So it's, that is just for performance reasons. Now, uh, oh, here the first query. Now, for something more complex, I skip this, is this query here. And, um, well, I don't expect you to immediately get into what is happening here. But actually, that is um, the magic of, of ADQL, that uh, kind of a magic of ADQL in here, and it's kind of the magic that the ESAC service is providing. What I do is I have a select subselection here. So in here, um, I'm querying the Tegas catalog. So I select subtuples from two tables, obviously. The first table is um, Gaia Data Release Tiga Source, that um, from the ESAC service. The second is table is the Tumor's best neighbor. So I'm take, querying the cross match table, and I make a join of these. The join is the Cartesian product that I talked about, and I join it on a position where this condition is met. And the condition shall be that positions in the Tegas catalog shall be in a cone around this position. And um, if we resolve this, this is the center of the Pleiades. So, and I take all of that, this result as a table. And I take this result and cross match that and join it with the Tumor's original valid um, cat um, um, table. And if I look into the metadata, this is the table, the Tumor's table. And from this, in, in here, I do have the colors, which I would need to, um, to make a color magnitude diagram because I, the Tegas catalog does not provide me with Tumor's colors. So, um, with this query, I basically not only um, query the Tegas catalog around this position, I also already confirm, uh, I already perform the, um, um, the, the the cross match with the Tumas catalog, and I do this at the position, well, the Tumas object ID. I don't know if people in the back can see this, but um, it will be, um, it, it's also on the web later, you will have a link for this. So, and if I run this query, then the result will also take a few seconds, and um, so I have now this, um, this table, and if I access the table, and now do the plot again, so I'm plotting the proper motion of um, Orion deck, oh, and why does it work? It doesn't work. Well, it does work, so, now it's getting not feasible, I need a mouse. Apologize for this. Um, 
And if again I zoom in here, then you see this is the density around the proper motion of zero, zero, and here I have my candidates of the Pleiades as before. So from here, I'll, from here, actually, then I would continue marking this area, well, having the subset of the Pleiades and um, then go on. But, um, so I will continue now with um, what, um, what, what I would do at this. So um, I open a new, if I come to that, I open a new pl plot window. Oops, need the top cut main window. Because now um, what I want to plot is um, a color magnitude diagram. So on the x axis, I'm plotting J Mac, uh, J -Mac minus K Mac, I, th I think. Oh, and I need to have a look at the metadata. You see, I don't know what's the name of the column, but since I have the metadata, um, uh, well, I won't explain it in detail how you do it in TopKit, but you see, I have the metadata with the, the data, so I can immediately look into it and search for the right, um, the right columns. And here I see, well, um, I took the J, the H, and the K Mac from, um, from, from, and they, uh, from, from Tumas, and they're called J underscore M. J underscore M minus, well, I only have H underscore M. And this should be minus J M. Um, then I see something like this. And if I now only mark the subset of the Pleiades in here, then you could roughly think about, well, this, oh, it's, I think, skipped and wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, so you see roughly, um, I made something wrong, but it should be, it should be roughly the main sequence that you have in here. Sorry, I'm a little nervous after all what happened. Um, then you can make a color Mach 2 diagram and, and see um, the main sequence in this data here. So, um, yes, so far for, for TopCut and the ADQL. Now, um, going back to this, this was the query that we performed for that. Now, what the heck was that? It was fast, I, I, I give you that. So, and if what I did was a little beyond your ADQL skills, then you're maybe a good candidate to attend to the hands-on tutorial, tutorials that we have, um, or the introduction and that we have after lunch in the room exactly in this direction, D52. Maybe you are familiar with ADQL already, but not an expert that, uh, yet. Then um, I would um, recommend that you go to the uh, hands-on sessions um, by the ESAC guys. And um, of course, um, I do see that uh, some of you might not be interested in ADQL that much because they, um, they'd rather send their PhD students to the, to the sessions than um, well, you, you are free or you, you might have a good go with um, André and the visualization sessions. Um, I offer a TopCat installation session for everybody who, is, um, who doesn't have TopCat already installed because we will need it in the hands-on session. So I will be in room D52 from 2.30 in an hour and we can have um, the TopCat installation session then. And yeah, well, I'm not yet full, fully finished what is about ADQL? Well, use it for accessing the Gaia data, but not only for the Gaia data. There are, as I said, 104 tab services out there that you can use for that. Get involved. That was, um, Alkio and Jesus already said that. Get involved in that. If you find something that's going wrong, please report bugs. We, imp we only improve by our, by our mistakes, and developers like people um, um, reporting bugs. That's, that's important. We don't improve if you don't do. I mean, I, I'm, we're making a bad product if it it's, keeps on being buggy. Please, please, please send us bugs. If you have questions and say, after the course, well, that's kind of nice, but it's not fitting my use case. I lack, I lack um, important function in there. Well, get involved. Tell us we are talking about that, and we will, we will, we will try to find a solution for that. Actually, the virtual observatory is there for you um, because we want to support and support um, um, astronomers. And last but not least, 
Um, of course, there are more data centers than these are, and here I, have, I make advertisement for our service at ARI. And with this, I will end. Thank you for your attention. And I see Mark is with us. Um, please well, give him an applause for being there. <laughs> Yeah, um, what are the more complicated mathematical functions that EDQL can support compared to uh, classic SQL? Um, as far as I know, is that the SQL standard, well, at least the one of 92, for instance, comes with a logarithm to the base of 10, which is um, not that important, but if you, if you program that in SQL, it slows down the performance. That's just an example. There is more of that um, in not all trigonometry, trigonometrical, I hope that was right. Um, functions were, what well, was wrong? Sorry. Ah, thank you. Chicken up. Uh, tr I won't try to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, not all were implemented in, in SQL and they come with ADQL, for instance, as well. And they, those are important for astronomers. Well, I think. Uh, I'm not an astronomer, as you may see, because I'm not even able to say trigo, tri tri <laughs> well, whatever. Is there a, a sort of query optimizer tool that can sort of help with uh, helping you put the, uh, the joins in the right order, for instance? Because this business about performance, I mean, for the, yes. little, for the little queries, it's not such um, a, a Yeah, business, well, there is, um, there, is not, there is not really an optimizer tool. Well, there is, um, databases come with a query planner that is kind of that thing that's running in the background that will optimize your messed up queries. And I mess up queries, everybody does mess up queries. Usually um, the query planner can do this with a, with a very, very little overhead. Um, there is, um, for instance, when you, when you perform, a, oops, when you perform a, a cross mesh or a join, there is a kind of an idea. I didn't take care when I did this, but there is kind of an idea when you do perform a join and when you um, perform a join, for instance, on a position, um, then you think about what's the smaller table that I compare with the other table. And um, numerically, it does make sense to, um, to let the smaller table be the one defining the circle. Because um, the database, thanks to heel picks, does have an idea if, um, uh, if, a, um, if an entry is in the right heel pick, heel picks, well, he'll pick in this case, um, is in the right pixel um, for, for, the, um, for this query. So the, the database itself can make an estimation. Algebraically, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense and no difference, but numerically, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you, if you do that. So the idea um, would be that um, the smaller table, and if you compare these, then you would say that the smaller table should be after the join. That's a roughly optimization for that already. I didn't take care for, for this query here because, um, well, as I said, sometimes in the VO um, you see wires sticking out. You don't see them in my presentation, of course, because I, um, I, tried not, I tried to avoid the ideas. Subqueries um, are um, in, in, a little messy. And it's very hard to, to implement subqueries in a, in a proper way. So um, sometimes, we have to admit this simply doesn't work in the way that we want. I cannot guarantee you that this subquery would work, ex this query would exactly work on, on any other tab service. I cannot say this. By subqueries, you always have to, to, um, to see that. So the, um, this query works, and, um, and it worked in this way, so I didn't care about optimization in this case. So, yes. Um, the solution for that might be, if you have a query that's taking longer, longer by longer, I mean longer than an hour, then usually, um, you see you can have ADQL query mode in synchronous, so usually you have up to two to three minutes for these queries and you have an asynchronous mode. Um, the asynchronous mode usually times out after an hour, I think. And um, you, if you have queries that may take longer, because you have a lot of data to compare, or a lot of, um, um, yeah, the petabytes, the petabytes that you have to upload, then usually you can ask um, uh, the people running a data service uh, and, and ask them um, about support, basically meaning like, I have this query, I want to perform this query with that data that I upload, can I have more time for my job? And they, uh, well, I, 
at least in Heidelberg, I think ESA will, will, will do the same if you ask them um, 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 to, to support you in this. Again, how do I find this? I didn't try, but I hope I have all the metadata about who I could ask in here. Uh, no, not really. But I do have in the, um, in the metadata of the service, I do find a web page where I could ask people um, to contact about the Gaia service and to ask for extension of the timeout. Thank you very much.